how can a local church, especially uh, an urban church, people who eat KFC and McDonald's and, you know, these kind of people who are so comfortable, uh, how can an urban church engage in missions? What can you and I do uh, in missions? And uh, uh, when we talk about missions, just to remind us, you know, we're talking about taking the message of Jesus Christ to people who've not really heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Taking that message to them. Or secondly, when we talk about missions, we're also talking about discipling new people. There are many places in India where people, you know, some of the things that we take for granted, even some of the basic truths that we take for granted, for them it's something so special to hear about. So for us to go and disciple them, these new believers, new churches, new communities uh, in the faith uh, is what we also talk about when we, uh, when we talk about missions or partnering or with others who are doing these kinds of things, empowering, working alongside those who are involved in each other, either reaching the lost or uh, discipling new believers, partnering with them, working with them. So all of this is what we call in that one word, missions. So how can we as a church, as a local church, an urban church, engage in missions? And I want to use the book of Acts and the New Testament here to draw out for us uh, some of the patterns that we see. Seven ways in which you and I uh, and we as a local church can engage in missions, in reaching our nation, parts of our nation that have never yet heard the gospel. And, uh, and then, so number one. How can a local church, an urban church, be involved in missions? Number one, church planting. You know, we are engaged in church planting. We started that right from the very beginning. We began with that vision to plant, to reproduce ourselves. Our goal was not and is not just to gather people in one place and have a nice time. Our goal is to spread all across the nation and then into the nations. And so we started that from the very beginning, planting churches around our nation. When you look at the church in Jerusalem, the church in Jerusalem was born on the day of Pentecost. A supernatural move of God birthed the church in Jerusalem. For eight years they were there. And then what happened? You know, there were 12 apostles. 120, you got 120 totally who were filled with the Holy Spirit. But in the first sermon, 3,000 new believers. A couple of days later, a lame man was healed, 5,000 more. So in a matter of weeks, you had a church of 8,000 people. That's huge. And what do we see happen in Jerusalem? We see believers being nurtured and growing up in the faith, maturing in the faith, in this church. People like Philip, people like Stephen, Barnabas, others, many others whose names we don't even have mentioned in the New Testament, grow up in this church and mature in this church. And approximately eight years later from the time the church is formed, the book of Acts chapter 8, there's severe persecution. And believers are scattered out of Jerusalem. Philip, who was a leader, a deacon in the church in Jerusalem, meaning he was just serving. Because of persecution, they are scattered out of Jerusalem. Philip goes down to Samaria and he preaches Jesus to them. People receive the gospel. A church is formed in Jerusalem, in, in Samaria. Others are scattered and other, go into other parts, other cities. So what happened? There were these unnamed believers who left Jerusalem. They traveled to different cities. They arrived in Antioch. They preached Jesus. People believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And a church was established in Antioch. Now what happens? What do we see happen in the church in Antioch? In a matter of two and a half years, this new church in Antioch, people grow up in the faith. Acts chapter 13, from Antioch, Paul and Barnabas are sent out. And they go around other cities planting churches. So church planting is one way that you and I, as, a, as, as, as an urban church, that we can be involved in missions. It's, it's, it's part of God's New Testament strategy to plant churches. Churches to reproduce themselves. Now, there are some, you know, struggles that many of us deal with when we talk about church planting. I want to address some of them here. First of all, we need to understand that all believers can plant churches. Amen? Now, we've got this wrong idea that I need to have a reverend 
before my name. Or I got to graduate from seminary or something like that to be able to plant a church. Or I need to be an apostle to plant a church. Or I need to be a prophet to plant a church. No. What you and I must understand is that God can use ordinary believers to raise up local churches. God can use you. Amen? The second thing is this. And this is like a big issue for many of us. It's about the call of God, the call to missions. Ask somebody, you know, why aren't you getting involved in missions? I haven't received the call yet. It is true that there are times where the Holy Spirit will speak very clearly, like the way he spoke um, to the church in Antioch. Separate me, Paul and Barnabas. This is Acts 13, 4. Separate me, Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas and Saul, for the work I've called them to. The Spirit of God speaks very clearly, very, uh, you know, maybe in a dream, a prophetic word. Uh, in some way, the Holy Spirit speaks a very clear words. Great. But most often... God guides us, moves us into missions, not necessarily by some, you know, audible voice that you hear, but just through the circumstances, the opportunities, the people, the pastor preaching to you, or an inner stirring of the Spirit. He moves us into that. Why did Philip go to Samaria? Not because the Holy Spirit said go. He ran to save his life. Well, what did he end up doing? He planted a church. Why did these believers, unnamed believers, land up in Antioch? Not because the Holy Spirit said, go to Antioch. They landed there. They're running for their lives. But what did they do? They planted a church. So demystify this call to missions. God is speaking through just the stirrings, the opportunities, the things that God is doing around you. Go with the flow. Recognize what God is doing. Don't sit down and say, I'm waiting for the Holy Spirit to speak. God's speaking. You're not understanding. You're not listening. Amen? So God is uh, speaking to us, even through the people, through the circumstances, the opportunities He's setting before us and saying, move! So basically, we need to take our feet off the brake pedal, take off the handbrake, please step on the, put your car in first gear, step on the clutch. Step on the accelerator, sorry. Start moving because you can always steer a moving vehicle. But a stationary vehicle can hear many voices and will go nowhere. Amen? Start moving. Opportunities come. Take it up. As you step out, God will begin to steer you and lead you into what He wants you to do for missions. And the third thing is this, you know, Sometimes we think church is just a place to attend and, you know, maybe they take care of my birthday, my wedding, and my burial. And, you know, church is for those purposes. And really, the church is a missions base. It's to equip you. You come in to be equipped so that you can go out and be a blessing. Amen? So that's what the church is about. It's about you being equipped so that you can go out and be a blessing to people. Second way that we can... Uh, as a local church, be involved in missions is to strengthen new believers and other local churches. What we receive, we impart to new believers, to other local churches, communities of believers around our nation. And we see this pattern in the book of Acts. When Philip goes down to Samaria and plants a church there, gets a, a group of believers there, new believers, what happens? Acts chapter 8 says in, in verses... Uh, 14 and 15, it says, Peter and John, they go from Jerusalem to Samaria. They minister. They strengthen these new believers. Minister the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Come back. Later on, we see that Barnabas is sent to Antioch. When a church is planted in Antioch, Barnabas goes to strengthen the believers there. And then he comes back. Or Barnabas actually stays there and continues on from there. We see in Acts 11, 27, that prophets rise up in Jerusalem. They go down to Antioch. A team of prophets go down to Antioch and strengthen that church. And they come back to Jerusalem. The same thing happens out of the Antioch church. When Paul and Barnabas go out from the Antioch church and plant more churches, they revisit all these new church plants and strengthen them. This is in Acts 14, 21 to 23. 
They go around strengthening those churches. So here's the second way you and I can engage in missions. Go strengthen new church plants, other churches around the nation. Disciple believers. Share with them all the good stuff you get here Sunday after Sunday. You go out and pour it out into their lives. Bless them. Number three, how can we as a local church engage in missions? Minister to specific physical needs of other local churches and communities of believers. Missions doesn't always have to be only about spiritual things. It also involves physical things, natural things, things that need to be addressed in, an, in everyday life. You see that happen when Judea, the church in Jerusalem and the, and the parts of Judea were going through food shortage, they were famine. The Antioch church, that's in Acts 11, the church in Corinth, the church in Macedonia, they get supplies together and they send it out to the church, to, to the believers in Judea to help them out. So missions, practical things, bringing relief, helping with the physical needs of people is part of what we can do in missions. Number four, the fourth way that we as a local church can engage in missions is through tent making. Now, many of you sitting here today, you are well-established professionally. You've got good jobs, working for some multinational company, successful. And, uh, and, uh, and, and you've, you know, you've heard us over time and time again talk about marketplace ministry. And you identify and recognize that God has a place for you in the marketplace. That he wants you to serve there, minister there. And, and you embraced your call to the marketplace and you are doing something Right where God has placed you in the business world or in arts and entertainment or media or government or uh, education or wherever God's placed you. You're doing something there. And now you're hearing about missions and you're saying we need to go. We need to do something. And, and some, for some of us we find this a contradiction. Because hey, I'm supposed to be engaged in the marketplace. I'm serving God in the marketplace right here in this city. And now you're telling me I need to go somewhere, do something uh, uh, among unreached people, among people who've never heard the gospel, or among new believers, how do I reconcile the two? It's very simple. You can use your profession, and God can and will use your profession, even in missions. The greatest example that we see is that of the Apostle Paul. In several places that he went, for example, in Corinth, you turn with me to Acts 18. Maybe just read a couple of scriptures here. Acts chapter 18. When Paul goes into Corinth, he finds another couple, Aquila and Priscilla, who are tent makers. And Paul has been trained as a tent maker. Acts 18, verse 1 onwards. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. So because he was the same trade, he stayed with them, and they worked. For by occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. We skip down to verse 11. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Number five, how can, a, how can an urban church be involved in missions? Of course, praying. Matthew 9, Jesus said, Matthew 9, 37, 38, Jesus said, pray that the Lord of the harvest that will send laborers into the harvest fields. Send laborers into the harvest fields. So you pray. Say, God, raise up laborers to go across into these parts of northern India. In two weeks, we'll give you more information how we can begin to pray. How we can, as a church can pray purposefully for our nation. Pray for those engaged in missions. You know, Paul asked for prayer many times. In Colossians 4.3, uh, he says, Brethren, pray for us. Pray that a door will be open for us and we'll have, we'll have boldness to proclaim the gospel the way we should proclaim. Um, I pray that God will preserve us from unreasonable and wicked men. So pray for those involved in missions. Number six, partner with those who are involved in missions. How can we engage, work with others, other organizations that are involved in missions? It's very interesting when you look at Paul and his ministry. After he had established the church in Corinth, he writes to them in 2 Corinthians 10, 13 through 16. He says, you know, God has given to each man a certain sphere of influence, a certain sphere of ministry. But he tells the Corinthians, he says, Corinthians, but I'm writing to you 
Because I hope that through you, my sphere of ministry will be enlarged so that I can take the gospel to other people as well. Meaning what he's telling the Corinthians is, he's saying the Corinthian church, God gave me a certain sphere of influence which included you, but now I want you to partner with me to go to other places. So we partner, work alongside with those who are reaching. And number seven, it's very simple. We must use, as an urban church, we must use all available means to minister the gospel. Amen? Just imagine Paul. You know, he traveled, he planted churches, but he also sat down and wrote. I don't know if Paul ever thought that the letters he wrote, almost 2,000 years later, people will be studying his letters. That it would become part of what we call the Bible, the Word of God. But he wrote, because that was one vehicle that could be used for the kingdom of God. Amen? 